The exhibition's called The Reclining Nude, and so it's an obvious sort of reference to the nude um, as it's been explored in art, art, art history. But more interestingly for me, um, the way it's been explored in modernist, recent modernist art history by the sort of the male heroic canons that we, you know, that, that sort of fill all our textbooks Picasso, Matisse, Henry Moore, etc. And um, I really love their work, but I'm also obviously very critical of it. Um, of any of these sort of female nudes, you know, the, the male gaze is sort of taking ownership of this naked body, and um, there's such sort of signature pieces. And uh, I guess my interest is in rewriting that with a sort of a feminist transcript. So my um, nudes are barely. Well, they're barely humans. They're sort of a series of elements found and cast and cobbled together. And, and I'm interested in how bringing dif different materials and elements together sort of creates um, a totally new reading of, of, uh, of the subject matter, which is only a female nude insofar as I name it. I title it as a female nude. Other than that, it's just a discombobulated mess, really. And, um, and I like that. It's an exploration of materials, of processes, of making and of meaning. Um, and for the viewer, the meaning is kind of whatever they read into it. Um, it won't be a nude for most people. They won't see a form in there. They won't see anything in there, except a series of materials. The centrepiece, which isn't necessarily the main piece, but it's certainly the biggest piece, um, titled Large Reclining Nude, directly after Matisse's um, painting by the same name. Um, it sort of operates um, as a, well, I'm, I'm sort of titling it obviously as a nude, but it looks and functions like a table. And I like this sort of, the surface is tiled like a tabletop is and, um, and it has legs, it, it pretty much, I like the idea of it actually sitting in someone's home and them sitting at it and, you know, putting their coffee cups on the nude, on the table. And, and you know, she has the, these, this ceramic pot pair of her breasts and there are these bronze sort of, uh, I guess, um, um, genitalia that are kind of like phallic rather than womanly. It's, it's a very much a, a coming together of, of um, archetypal motifs and contemporary materials and utilitarianism. You know, it's very functional. Um, and there's something I really like in that about that sort of uh, multifaceted reading of the work and, and the possibilities of it coming from a functional realm and going back into a functional realm and being an artwork just for the moment that it's in the gallery, basically and then hopefully living as a table for the rest of his life. I think something kind of magical happens when different processes come together and are sort of um, presented, juxtaposed, I suppose, in relationship to each other. Uh, there's a, I guess I like bringing together really traditional materials like bronze. I do a lot of hand casting in bronze and um, I work with ceramic, very DIY. I'm very lo-fi in this stuff, you know, and that's part of the non-mastery of that is really essential to me. That's what keeps me really interested in it, particularly maybe because I am a perfectionist. So I don't, once I control it, I kill it. And I want to keep it just out of my own reach. It makes it, it gives it some sort of integrity to me. So I like bringing together these traditional materials with sort of really contemporary synthetic materials as well. Soft Kiss is a pretty sort of seminal piece in this body of work for me because um, it sort of comes, I found the original piece which I then went on to cast at a secondhand junk shop and it reminded me a lot of uh, a Brancusi headpiece and um, I love Brancusi sculptures and I was so sure it was an actual um, remake of a Brancusi and I guess the fact that I couldn't be certain, it was so, it so closely resembled it that it, it was close enough that it actually um, was Brancusi-esque enough for me. And I like that somehow we embody all these, or, or we absorb all of these monumental and seminal artworks through our lifetimes, you know, of looking at artwork, of reading about it, high school, art history, art school, everything. We, we almost absorb these, um, these works unconsciously into our psyche. You know, th there's such big players in the gallery in the back of our minds, you know, or my mind anyway, that they, the details of the works don't even matter anymore. They sort of become approximations of the original. That's what I'm left with, that residual sort of after effect of this lifetime of looking at images. And I like drawing on these sort of like the vibe of the original. And you know, and that's enough of a link for me to feel like I'm 
close to greatness, you know. And with this, when I found this Brancusi-esque work, I thought, I love it. I love that I can't be sure that it's the real thing or not. And it's that not knowing, it's that derivative relationship to the original, that sort of severing and, and sort of sliding away from the original that I like. The original is lost. Obviously, the original's in a museum somewhere. But, I mean, it, the, the tie, the link to the original it has been deferred so many times and I'm deferring it again by recasting a fake Brancusi-esque version of something that was fake to begin with that lent to the original somewhere along the line. And the each level of deferral kind of, um, I guess, becomes closer now to owning its own originality. Now it's an original because it's got no link to the original that it was referencing. So it sort of takes on, uh, it's at a new level of originality, if you know what I mean. I <laughs>